Well, we'll go ahead and get this Bible study started this morning. So if you'd all like to bow your heads with us, we'll open with prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you. Thank you for this holy day, this extra Sabbath that we have to enjoy and to fellowship with one another, to study your word and to learn and to grow. We pray for your assistance with the work that we have to do, that we all have to do, the, the great deal of work that's before us to serve as a witness and a warning to this world. We pray that you strengthen us in this, that you watch over us and you guide all our endeavors and bless it. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be here with us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you all for being here. The title of this Bible study is Do the Work. Do the work. Um, you know, often that, that has the, the connotation of only the formal or organized aspect of it. But I guess what I'd really like to get at today is that that is a large part of it, but there is a lot more of it. And as and we are, we are a whole, we are, we are one whole body of Christ working towards this thing. And everybody has a part to play in that, one way or the other. And so that's sort of what we're going to get into. First scripture I'd like to kick it off with today is Matthew 5. 14 through 16, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's a uh, that's very that's a very personal part of it. You know, the thing that he singles out in this shining before the world here is good works. You know, we do those, we can do those collectively, we can do them as a whole, but often that comes as a very uh, personal spur of the moment kind of thing, seeing a need and meeting a need, you know, being ready to being ready to help and to comfort and to give advice whenever it's it's needed. And it's a it's a personal responsibility and I, I feel like we just can't we can't put too little emphasis on the personal examples that we set for those around us because you are a, a Christian all the time. You're a member of the body of Christ all the time, you know, at, at work, in public, wherever it is that you may be or whatever you may be doing. That is when your light needs to be shining the most. I, I think maybe we all have... Uh, individuals that we look up to, role models, and things like that. And I, I feel like the, the thrust of this scripture is in each individual being one of those kind of role models to, you know, the, the world is so so set against hypocrisy and with, with good reason. And it, when you, you know, there's a tendency to dismiss Christianity because, well, people, you know, can never live up to that. Well, we can never live up to that all the time. Of course, we falter, and this season reminds us of, of a lot of that. But to be... Christian, to be in public, to be acting like a Christian, to show somebody that example of what it means to be fair and kind and loving and concerned and helpful is, you know, you can't put a price on that. You can't, you can't pay for that anywhere. That's one of the things that, that amazes me is when you hear somebody that will acknowledge, you know, well, I don't understand what you believe. I don't know what you believe, but I know one thing, you believe it because they see us doing what it is we're supposed to do, and they look at the world, and I've heard people say, I don't want to have anything to do with church, I'm Christian, not the hypocrites. Everyone I'm out, and you're like, you know, and then you see things, you see stuff going on in the churches, and you're like, that, that is hypocritical. So that's why people of the world don't want to have anything to do with churches, because a lot of the churches that they're used to, people don't live up to what they're supposed to do. And again, my experience has been with people that just in talking or hearing them say that, you know, they'll say or remark to somebody that, you know, again, I don't understand what you believe, but I know you believe it. And to me, that's the highest praise you can have from somebody who doesn't understand is that they see in you that you're doing what it is you believe from what God has shown you. And that's what we're supposed to be doing, setting that example. Uh, I believe that uh, we all agree that hypocrisy is one of the worst enemies of religion. And uh, non-believers or the uninitiated are the first one to recognize hy hypocrisy. They can see it from a mile away. So we have to be, we have to hold the bar up very high. And Jesus, and throughout the Bible, even the Old Testament, it talks about taking care of the fatherless and the widow and the poor and those in need. And you look back and see what Jesus did, who he cared for, the people he cared for. If we're to follow his example, we certainly want to be taking care of those things and not leaving them left undone. One of the things uh, he, that he said to those who did not believe him, and maybe this was more in regard to 
uh, outstanding miracles and healings and things like that. But he said, believe me for the very work's sake that you see. You know, if you can't, you know, psychologically come to the conclusion that this is right, look what's happening right before you and know that it is, you know, what he says it is. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Where do you find an opening? When we're talking about doing the work, you know, the, the good works and all that, but spreading the truth also, where do you find an opening? You never, you never know when there's going to be an opening uh, that you can just slide a little clue into about the truth, about, you know, what the, what, what the Bible says and teaches and, you know, how that can inform and enrich your lives, uh, that you have to be ready to give those answers. You know, if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it, then you're certainly not ready to uh, explain yourself if, if the time should come in, in any logical way uh, that's going to help anybody out. I, I really remember, and <laughs> this is always stuck with me, uh, you don't remember everything from when you're in school, but in seventh grade, now, you know, I'm going around, I'm giving all my teachers my note, I'm going to be gone for the feast, and my math teacher asked, what's a tabernacle? And I was like, <laughs> it beats me, you know, I'm going to the beach, though, it's going to be, it's going to be great, I'm going to go to church every day, like, it's going to be awesome, but I, you know, 12, 12 year old me was not really sure in that moment what a tabernacle was, I was certainly uh, not ready at that point in time. And you know, sometimes when you get a question from somebody at, uh, you just buy, maybe you dump on them and you give them too much. So maybe also knowing, like seeing what their actual interest is and just giving them a taste to get them interested. I remember talking to somebody that was uh, baptized not all that long ago and it, his, he had something to say like that about uh, a grandparent who had just here and there along the way just thrown out a little bit just come make a comment, some little thing. And he said that it just slowly over time it got him interested and then it got him asking questions and then to reading and studying on his own and then to baptism, which is a, which is a huge process, but it starts with a little breadcrumb, maybe an unleavened breadcrumb. We're going to adapt this to today. Ethi uh, Philip, when he met the Ethiopian eunuch, <coughs> you know, he asked him, is he speaking of himself or another? And the Bible says that he stepped up in the chariot with him and he began at that scripture. He didn't give him a long litany of history of the church of God or here's, how you, here's all the things you have to do. He just started right there and preached Christ and him crucified. And that was enough for this man to be converted, baptized right there in the moment. And I thought that was... You know, example, we because we're you're right. A lot of times we dump the whole train car load on people, and it is way too much for people to handle at once. Yeah, you can only take in so much information at one time, especially if you're hearing new and different things, or you don't have the background to uh, appreciate it. You know, we we take a we take we take maybe we take a lot for granted that you know everybody we're somehow on the same page, and the level of biblical literacy in, in the world is, is lower than it even was once upon a time. You know, it's, it's lower than it was. You know, you start making scriptural points to somebody, well, if they don't know who any of the people are or when it was or what they're talking about, they might not be able to appreciate, you know, your long, complex point. Yeah, I, I, had a, I learned a lesson. Uh, I had a friend that I worked with, and we were having some conversations. He, he knew about the plain truth. His family had read it. He knew a little bit about the Sabbath. We'd had some discussions. And I said, well, won't you come to church? And so he said, okay. So him and his wife showed up at church. And of course, it's like most of you know, our group is small, so when new people come in, it's like, oh, new people. Everybody gets excited. <laughs> and so we, we had the sermon, and after church was over, now they came in, they came in a little bit late, and so they didn't have any choices in the seats, so they had to sit at the back of the room away from the door. And so they went back and sat down. So after services was over with, we began talking fellowship. Everybody just congregated around them, and suddenly it was, "Oh yeah, we don't we don't eat pork, we don't," do, and just start hitting him with all of our doctrine. <laughs> I mean, it was, I realized I'm like, "This is overwhelming because you're hitting them with every piece of doctrine we have, and they're just coming to visit." I mean, he already had some understanding, but anyway, so you could just see in their face they were wishing they were closer to the door. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we had them blocked off. I mean, they were literally trapped. They couldn't, without pushing people out of the way, get to the door. So finally it, it dissipated and they left. And they never came back. That was it. It was just too overwhelming. That's when I realized, like what you're all saying, you, you can't hit people with everything. 
uh, as excited as you are, you've got to temper that down. And uh, I've learned that, you know, let them ask a question. If they ask a question, give them an answer. You don't have to give them the whole doctor. Just answer the question and see how that conversation uh, forwards. You don't take a baby and give them a T-bone steak when they're born. <laughs> you know, you nurse them along. Sometimes, and, and the ball, Paul even talked about that, using milk as, as doctrine. I mean, they, people have to be brought along until they reach spiritual maturity. So... I think it's a great example of that. A good nature analogy might be over fertilizing a plant. You know, the right amount of fertilizer will produce amazing results, but you put too much on there and you just burn it and it's gone. <laughs> Maybe some of you have done that already this spring. I don't I don't know. Not that my hard to do. My yard. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in a couple months, maybe it'll really take off. Uh, <laughs> it's different. Uh, Ephesians 2, reading in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained before that we should walk in them. And verses 19 through 21. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. We're, I, I put that one in there to make the point that we're all in this together. You know, we're built on Christ, the chief cornerstone, you know, the apostles, the prophets, all, all, the, all the wonderful examples that we have in these holy books here before us. And that we are adding to that, and it's, it's a careful... It's a careful process. Uh, you know, there's a scriptures about whether or not your, your work stands when it's tried in fire uh, later on. And that's, it's Im important to remember that. And that when we're, when we're, doing, we're doing outreach or we're giving, we're, we're giving an example to people or we're contributing something to their knowledge or we're trying to or following up on interests that maybe they already have, that you do have to follow through with the whole thing. And I would compare that to uh, a really great advertising campaign for a really bad product. Like you might, you know, you might get a whole lot of interest, you might sell a whole lot of them at first, but word's gonna get around that this thing does not live up to the hype. So just, you have to be, you know, you have to be the kind of truth that you are trying to spread. And that, that certainly applies uh, to the church to when people come in when they start getting interested, that's, you know, that's the moment to stand firm. I think sometimes too it has to do with the way you, even the way you dress, the way you present yourself, the way your facility looks, whether you start on time, just the organizational part of your church group, you know, that when somebody comes in, they don't, you know, look at look at your facility. Or sometimes we've, we've met in some horrible hotel rooms in the past, and I know that's uncontrollable, but whatever you have, make it the best you can. Make it the cleanest you can. Make it the most presentable and in, inviting to anyone who would come for the very first time because you... You really only get one shot in most cases. You only It's like the billboard. You only get three seconds to read it. If you don't get your message across, they're already gone by 70 miles an hour and you miss it. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when you're first starting out, you're going into something new, you're looking at it and you see it and you look at everybody else and you're like, how can they not see this? And you question it. And you're like, if I do this, go to church on Saturday? Everybody else is going on Sunday. And a lot of people are looking to find out things, but they're also looking for an excuse to quit. Mm -hmm. And people will pick the slightest thing and be like, well, that room was dirty and nasty. I don't have a meat there. I'm not going back there. Or, you know, well, there's no children here, so we're not coming here. We'll find someplace else and never find a place. Uh, so... People tend to look for excuses not to do something, especially if it's different than what everybody else is doing, because we don't like to be different. We want to blend in. We want to be part of the crowd. Did you want to read Romans? Okay. Yeah, I'd like to uh, read Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 4 and go through 8. Now, I'm going to be reading the contemporary English version because uh, it brings out some good points that I want to make clear. So Romans 12, beginning of verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth or te on teaching. 
Or he that exhorteth on exhort, or exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So this is pretty much laying out the church is made up of different people. Now I'm going to ask a question. And <clears throat> just be honest. How do you feel? How many of you feel like you have a talent? Just raise your hand. <laughs> a talent. That you believe you have a talent. Okay, I've got two. <laughs> So the rest of you are wrong. <laughs> Everyone sitting in here has a talent. And that's what's important because you start talking to people, they're like, well, I don't have a talent. I'm like, yeah, you do. No, I don't have a talent. And like for me, I'm in electronics. I can take something electronic, it doesn't matter what it is, I can sit down with it if I've never seen it and I can figure it out and it's not that hard because the way my brain thinks, it just looks at something and it falls into place. So when people are like, you know, like the big joke was, you know, go in somebody's house and the VCR is flashing because they don't know how to set the clock. And I'm like, set the clock? I don't know how. It's two buttons. It's not hard. <laughs> you know, but I realized that for some people, technology and stuff is hard. It doesn't come naturally to them. I have a talent for that. I don't call it a talent because it's natural to me. So you see, things that are natural to you are actually your talent. You know, people who have singing or enjoy singing, that's a talent. Well, of course, that, you know, everybody, oh, that's a talent. But do you know that hospitality is also a talent? Being the person, when somebody comes in the door, you just walk up to them and go, hey, it's great to see you. Glad you're here. I was telling uh, Michael early, we did this, uh, it was a discipleship Bible study. And one of the things was a test. You take a test to see where you're at in different levels of discipleship. In hospitality, I scored a zero. <laughs> hospitality does not come natural to me and I don't I mean I don't mind people coming and staying with me or, or whatever but I don't go around and go hey what's your mother the house and spend the night that's not me I don't mind them doing it but I'm not going to offer it because it's just not natural to me there's some people that so you see well won't you stay with us don't go to no hotel stay with us it's just natural to them to be hospitable and again greeting people at the door I mean that makes a big difference when you're new and you come in and you're already nervous and somebody goes, to go, hey, how are you doing? It's glad you're here. It's nice to meet you. And, and you open that door for conversation. So people would say like, well, that's not a talent. It is a talent. So I'm telling you now, over my experience, I have learned everyone in the church has a talent. You're just not aware of it a lot of times because it's so natural. People who cook, that's not a talent. I fix food, it's no big deal. That's a talent. Some people, I won't name names, can't do toast. <laughs> you know, so seriously, you know, it's a joke, but you look at it like, well, that's no big deal. I'm telling you, it's a talent. But now there's another side of that coin because we have people who come to the church. Just because you think you have a talent doesn't mean you have a talent. <laughs> uh, you know, there's people who will write articles and they see an article, here, look at this, and it's like, eh, no, you shouldn't be writing. That's not mm -hmm. your talent. Yeah. You know, or, you know, no, you're really, really not a teacher. You know, just talking to people is not the same thing as teaching. There's a difference. And so, again, there are gifts, which means there's people who don't have those gifts. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just recognizing what your gifts are. And I would, I would recommend that when you're searching for your talent or trying to figure it out, don't try to figure it out on your own. Walk up to your friends. Walk up to some, the people who know you and go, do I have a talent? And I will guarantee you they will tell you what they see and you'll be like, really? Because you don't recognize it as being a talent. But I will tell you, everyone in here has a talent. Uh, that I know with, with that doubt. I was just going to add, uh, you know, we were talking la last night or yesterday about the difference in personalities and some people just don't click with each other. You know, I mean, there's a certain attraction, I mean, just through chemistry and personality, and so when someone new comes in, it may not always be the pastor or the, the uh, overseer of the congregation that is the one that sh should be approaching the person. Maybe you have the gift of gab or whatever it is, you know, and, and the personality that people are willing to listen to you and, and, and converse with you and makes them feel comfortable. And once they feel comfortable, then they will most likely come back. Even just being a good listener. It's quite, it's quite a, it's quite a talent, uh, you know, having a lot of people just want to talk and having somebody that can listen and be interested and, you know, every, everybody needs to talk and to share their experiences and, 
you know, just finding common ground, like Stan was talking about. You know, that you do you do click with some people more so with others, and you mm-hmm. maybe that's your person when they come in the door. Maybe that's the person you're going to uh, click with, but you're gonna have to get to know them a little bit to find out. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about bridling your tongue. You know, of course, it's talking about it from an evil aspect. You know, about spreading gossip and all that. But, you know, the joke is you have two ears and one mouth, and you should listen, learn to listen to people instead of being so interested in thinking about what you're going to say or tell them. People need to tell their story. They want desperately. We have encounters many times in restaurants. I can't tell you how many times you give people an ounce of attention or love, and they will dump their whole life on you. Now, we don't like that when we're trying to eat, but... (laughs) At a service or at a congregation when someone comes in and they want to dump their life story, they are unloading a ton of stress and burden that's on them, and just telling you about it will help. So you need to be a great listener. I'd like to continue with a couple of scriptures in Revelation here. Revelation 1, 5 through 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Also in Revelation 5, 9 and 10, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It is, it is very, very high calling that each and every member of the church, everyone who God is calling during this time period has in the future to be kings and priests. And maybe that's, maybe that's more... Of a, of, a, of a lofty goal than you entertain personally, or maybe you're daunted by that. But as we've been talking about, everybody has some gift. Everybody has some thing that has been given to them. And with God's Holy Spirit, it will increase uh, you know, just, to, just to be able to see the justice in a matter, having, having the discretion to, you know, uh, having empathy, having being honest, being able to see the honest truth of a situation or, and maybe share that or maybe just know to, to other people who are not involved. Like that's an example as well, to be able to, to, be able to rightly divide what is going on around you. Those are traits that we all have to have just to get through life as a Christian. You have to develop all of those traits just to be able to navigate to be able to navigate through, and we can do that with God's help, and that is the kind of kind of help that we are going to be empowered to extend to the world at some point in time after Christ's return. We will all be a part of that great work, and there's going to be a lot of work to be done at that point in time, and God can increase those gifts in us, and he can help us with our weak spots, and he can certainly increase our strong points even more. Well, I, I just add to that that uh, we all go through periods where we're, you know, we have highs and lows in our life, and sometimes we don't want to deal with other people, you know. And you, you just have to sort of remember how you felt at one point in your life, perhaps, you know, what, what kind of things you were dealing with. And, uh, you know, the people that went before us, though, they blazed a trail. I mean, we have to follow their example. We have to hold the truth to the very end. We're carrying the torch now, so we have to bear whatever comes, no matter what problems come along. We have to, uh, you know, we lose strength from time to time. We get downtrodden, depressed about it, but we got to, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, as they say, and, and, and motivate ourselves somehow and ask for God for strength to continue on because it, it is a long journey that we uh, face at times. I remember early in my church life hearing a phrase, and I didn't understand it because I'd never heard it before. I mean, I came out of a Baptist background, and it was not something that you would have heard, but it still kind of fits with them, too. It's just they don't know what this way it is. But it was called pay and pray. And it was basically you come to church, you tithe, and you pray, and that's all. You don't do anything else. And I learned early on that's not how it's supposed to be. Uh, Again, it takes everybody that God calls for the church to be successful. 
I mean, you know, when I was called and, and saw the truth and started coming in, and then you start looking back, and I'm like, what were you thinking? Why in the world would you call me? I have absolutely nothing to offer. I see all these other people. I see the things they do. I see the speakers, how wonderful the speakers are, the singers, how beautiful they sound. And I'm like, what good am I? I mean, do you realize some things? I was asking God, why did you make a mistake? And that's what it is. You know, so we, God has called us. That right there lifts everything up. God has called you out of the world. And he has called you in to be part of his peculiar people. So it is important, and we all need to understand, and if you look at uh, James chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God has called us out of the world. And as I said, he has given us gifts. What good's a gift if you don't use it? What good is a talent if you never share it with anybody? And this is something that God has given us. He expects us to share it. He expects us to use it because we're all part of the church. It takes everybody to create the church. It's not just the ministers. We have a job to do. It's not just the deacons, the deaconesses. It's not just the people who come in and set up. It takes all of us. What, what if we were here and we showed up to speak, but no one had put the chairs out? No one had set this table up here. No one had put the microphones up. We would more or less just kind of be standing here, <laughs> waiting, you know. You ought to be standing out there wondering, and we'd be trying to talk to you and read papers and Bibles and stuff while everybody's standing up. How, how long would that go? How soon before we'd be like, well, I'm not standing here for another 30 minutes. I'm out of here. It takes the people who put the chairs up. I'm amazed at how people don't understand that that is an important part of service, making sure the auditorium is ready to go. And they think, well, that's no big deal. You're, you're serving. And, and I remember uh, one of the things I learned, and I learned from Mr. Mr. Nunnery, is what a true servant really is. You don't ask, what can I get from you? It's what, what can I do for you? And you think about the brethren that way. What can I do to make the brethren have a better time? What can I do to make the brethren, brethren feel like that they're welcome? And you do that to provide that. It's, it's called serving, which is what we're supposed to do. Today's world is, what do I get? What, what are you going to give me? And that's how the world looks at things. What am I going to get? What am I going to take? We're supposed to look at the world like, how can I serve you? That's an action. It's not a sit on the couch, sit in a chair. It's do something. And that's what I think a lot of people forget sometimes as they start coming to church and they sit in the chair in the congregation. They listen to the sermons and they talk a little bit and then they leave and they don't think anything about anything else. Do you look around and see? I remember, uh, well, for instance, last night I was helping set stuff up. But Mark walked up to me and he was like, you shouldn't be doing that. I'm like, it's what I do. I mean, there's something to be done, I'll do it. I remember the first time I went to Panama City, uh, I was standing down the room when they were setting up and I was standing there because, you know, I'm used to getting out and doing it. I was just standing there because they had it all covered. Stan walked up to me and he's like, you feel lost, don't you? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I do. He said, you're used to doing stuff. I'm like, yeah. He said, they got it covered. Let them do it. You enjoy yourself. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I can enjoy myself, but I can't enjoy myself when there's stuff to be done. Yeah. You know, and I've told people, if you go to the feast and you're used to doing something, most places you go to, they will find something for you to do. Well, we're always looking for help. But if you're used to doing something and then you don't, I will tell you, you will go home and you will feel like you missed part of the feast because that's something that just helps you by serving and once you do it, you'll never quit. And it's something that we should all do. And again, using your talents because you got them. It. It's just a matter of figuring out what it is and how you can apply it. Jesus gave the example of um, talents. You know, he uses that term. And, you know, the one that was counted 
unworthy was the one that buried his talent. You know, he just didn't use it at all. And really that was the lesson Jesus was trying to make was you need to use your talent so that it brings forth fruit. And that was uh, very important. Uh, and the man that didn't was, was cursed because he didn't offer to use his talent to benefit, you know, God's people and God's church. Yeah, talents, be they ever so humble. You know, it could be it could be things, and I think a lot of what we've discussed is is good and it's and it's right. And you know, maybe your talent goes farther than that. Maybe your talent is a skill. You know, imagine what you have to offer to someone who needs you. If you're you know a mechanic or a plumber or whatever whatever your skill may be, if you can embroider or sew or whatever it is, you know, a skill is a talent to some. A a, a well honed skill is a talent. Anything that you do or you know about that you could give insight to somebody who's dealing with that situation you know if you're a dentist or a doctor or a nurse or what even if you're a fireman or something like that you know you could you could give good advice about how not to burn your house down or how to, <laughs> how to put it out if it catches on fire you know whatever it is that you have that you have been trained with that is that is a, a talent to some extent or it's at least an area of expertise and at some point in time it, it kind of becomes the same thing if you use it for good if you use it to help others because more so in this world than perfect understanding of doctrine or prophecy or whatever it may be, the world needs some, some basic truth. You know, you need to, to not be ripped off by people left, right, and center so that you can enjoy life and so you can trust others. Uh, it needs healing, needs some mercy and some love to overcome a lot of problems, physical problems, spiritual problems, people that are, you know, the hard-heartedness or selfishness out there, people who who feel just despair that they don't, you know, that it's not worth continuing anymore. There are a great many things that are needed out there that are not uh, not necessarily what you would uh, consider the highest gifts or something like that. You know, even if you don't speak a dozen languages doesn't mean that you don't have some practical or even physical comfort or help to give to someone else. We all have something to give to those around us. I'd like to continue with Mark 2, 16 and 17. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Not everybody's sick in the same way. Not everybody needs the same thing. There was that young man that came to Christ and, you know, he wanted to, you know, what's the way to eternal life? He knew what the, what the goal was in the end and he was concerned about how to get there. And Christ told him, keep the commandments. And he said, yeah, I, I do that. You know, I do that already. And he said, one thing you still lack. And it was, it was service. It was, you know, giving up the, the, the great possessions that he had you know he was he was given the opportunity to go along with Christ maybe he had gifts that would have been very useful maybe he was one of those people that Christ needed as one of his disciples or that could have done a lot more good in the world that way than being comfortable and wealthy back at home you know we don't know we speculate based on that but everybody needs something different he needed he needed, he wanted, he wanted to make this a sure thing. He needed to go with Christ to be able to give that up, and that was too much for him. Maybe he was too attached to that. But being able to discern what is needed in those that we encounter, what is needed in the world, is, is a big part of our personal and collective work. The gospel is for all nations, each of which have different problems, uh, like we read about in the in the churches, or that you know, Christ came for the healing of the nations of all the different nations. You know, all the different nations of the world have different problems, have different strengths and different weaknesses. You know, some of the some of the most poor and brutal and backwards places, there are there are more devoted, faithful people there than you might find in the average American city. Out of their necessity, like they have that desire and they cling to that portion of the truth. Well, that's different from the problem. They have a lot of practical problems about governments and establishing the rule of law and trust. And because, you know, you get into the idea that, uh, well, everybody's crooked and on the take and everything is corrupt. And it is, but that breeds more of that environment when you start doing it as well, because everybody else is, you know, we have a reasonable amount of law and order here in the United States. We have our, we have our problems with it, but, you know, comparatively, it's, it's a pretty good and safe place. We've got that under control. 
On the other hand, we have a whole lot of spiritual and psychological problems that do not affect regions who are not as wealthy or as blessed as we are. It's, it's different wherever you may go. We're not all sick in the same way. I wanted to read that scripture that we, he mentioned there. It is Jesus standing up in the synagogue there on the Sabbath day. He unrolled the, roll of the, the scroll of Isaiah and he said, uh, the spirit of the Lord has borne me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And to, uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Oftentimes we encounter people that are sinners like Jesus. He associated with sinners and publicans and people that were downcast, people that were downtrodden, people that psychologically, physically, whatever it might be, had a whole list of afflictions in their life. And Jesus dealt with them one by one. He dealt with them very patiently. He didn't tell them, you're a bunch of rotten sinners. Those people needed the physician, and he was there to heal them, and both physically and spiritually. And that was his job, and I think that it is our job as well to offer that graciously and patiently long-suffering with people. You know, people have a lot of problems. They come to church, and they're trying to overcome problems. They're not going to do it in one day. It takes years sometimes for people to overcome some of the things in their life, some situations that they're unable to deal with, family situations that you can't expect them to overcome in one day or one week or, or a year even at times. Sometimes it's decades before people can actually muster the strength, have the courage, and have the faith and the wherewithal to overcome those problems. And God gave us that time to do such. I've used this example before, but it's one of those things in your life, and the things happen in your life where basically you have an epiphany and you understand things differently. And this was at a feast, and a large group of us had gone out to a restaurant. And I mean, there was probably about 60 of us, long table, you know, they served us. There's about four different girls who were waiting on us, service, you know, it was a little bit slow. But again, with me, I'm like, that's fine because I'm here to fellowship. The food's just going to be a part of it because I'm hungry, but I'm more here to talk. So the longer they take to get it to me, the longer I can talk. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I know. And so, <laughs> but, you know, so we're, we're enjoying it. The food was good. The service was good. Up until the point in time when we had to pay the check. And the waitress came out and said, you know, here's the bill. And we're like, well, no, you're going to divide it up amongst everybody. And she just got this look on her face like, we, we can't do that. So, well, you're going to have to do it. What do you mean you can't do that? Who, who's ever heard of that, that you can't break up a check? I mean, that's <laughs> simple to do. You just, you know, whatever. And, I, and people started getting upset because she said that their software, and that's what it was, it was their software was not made to break up a check like we needed. And so basically, like, okay, well, each of you come up. And just, you know, you, you tell us what you had, we'll check it off, you pay your part, and that's how we'll do it, you know. But people were already now getting upset because they didn't get what they wanted, they didn't get the check broke up the way that they wanted it broke up. So we're going up to the counter to pay, and I'm standing there with everybody else waiting because, like I said, it was a large group. So we're standing there around the counter, and the girl's sitting there, and she's just going through it, and people are just like, I have stupid is it that they can't even split up a check. That's <laughs> ignorant. Never heard of such a thing like that. And just going on and on and on and getting angry. And I stood there, and I watched this girl who was trying to do get it done, checking things off, getting people's money, and she just starts bawling. I mean, she just starts crying. And another girl comes from the back. She leaves and goes to the back. She comes up, and she finishes checking us all out. And I realized, do you think that girl would ever come to our church? Knowing that we're a church group and that we had treated her that way, that we complained like that, after having a good meal and enjoying our fellowship, that we basically just raked her over the coals for something that wasn't even her fault. It was the boss who, who owned the place, who didn't have the proper software to be able to handle that. I mean, again, I haven't heard of such a place where you can't break up checks, but they didn't. So they either couldn't do it, didn't have the software, whatever it was, they couldn't. But yet... People got angry and brought a girl to tears. I was never so ashamed of my life. And I always remember that, that we've got to be careful. You can't go out and, and, and judge people because these people are coming in, they're broken, they're sick. We don't know what's wrong with them. And if they come through and you immediately start judging them, you immediately put your mind in a box towards that person. And that's the worst thing you can do. 
because we all know, I mean, sitting here calmly and talking about it, you know, we know we were all sinners. We know where we came from. We know what our sins are. And so yet somebody else comes in and their sin is no different than ours. We're, you know, we're just as bad as they are. Problems that they had, we may be further along, maybe we've gotten better at conquering that. But how can we sit and listen to them or show them any kind of empathy or sympathy about what they're going through when we're sitting there going like, really? You wear coveralls to church? <laughs> I mean, we had a man at one service, we, the one church that I attended that, um, and again, where I'm from is a poor part. They, they say the county I live in is the poorest county in Virginia. So people do what they can do. We had a man who was coming to church and he wore coveralls coveralls, I guess are actually overalls, I get too mixed up, overalls every Sabbath. But now these were nice. They were clean. Basically it's what we call up around my way, it was his Sunday go to meeting, coveralls, overalls. So he was coming in, well, there was a couple people like, well you know, let's, let's get him a suit, we'll give him a suit. And they went up to the guy and started offering him clothes. And he was like, why? Because he was wearing his best. And we were saying, your best is not good enough. And he got hurt, and he never came back. It doesn't take much. And again, you know, people are loving people, but they don't think about the things that you do, things that you say, and how it affects people. And so you got to be careful about those things. I mean, when somebody walks in, you know, there's, there's a joke about when people walk in that people immediately judge them on how they're dressed. And they go to the other side of the church. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to greet people and show them love and kindness again so that we can hear what it is they need to, to say. Because if you think back, how many people could you tell about your beliefs as you started finding them out? How many people could you go and say, hey, Saturday's a Sabbath. And they were like, it is? Wow, that's wonderful. No, most of the time I look at you like, you got a brain problem or something? <laughs> well, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so you have no one to share that with. And then somebody comes in where we do believe in the Sabbath and we do believe in these things. And they walk in like, you're all meeting on Saturday. Yes, we do. We enjoy it. Glad to have you. Just having that ability, the load that's lifted, because now I'm not that weird. You know, there's other people who believe what I believe. It's just finding those people. But if we chase them off because we look at them and we judge them or we raise our nose to them because they're not our kind of people, um, you know, again, I've, I've had people ask and people say like, well, what would you do if two homosexuals come walking into the church? I said, I would greet them, you know, and once I figured out that they were homosexual, you know, if they were holding hands, two men holding hands or something, I would let them know that we don't believe in that. If you want a fellowship, if you're, because I don't know who God's calling. God may be calling them and they just haven't seen that what they're doing is a sin yet. Maybe they're on the verge of it. I'm like, you know, you don't, please don't be doing those dis displays in church because we don't believe in that. And if they did that, I would be fine. I would be fine with them sitting there listening to a sermon. I'm not going to pull any punches. Never have. If I'm going to give a sermon about homosexuality, I'll give a sermon about homosexuality. And it's going to hit how it's going to hit. But I'm not going to look at them and go, like, get out of here. We don't have your kind here. <laughs> how are they ever going to find God's truth if God's calling them? And I definitely don't want to stand before God and have him go, you remember them two people? You ran off? I was calling them, and they turned away and never came, to, never came to me. There's not only people inside the church, I mean outside the church, but uh, also people inside the church as well, you know, can easily be offended by some of the things that we do, you know, that um, they, may, they may have been coming to church for some time, and then we, we do something that can actually offend them in, in, in a way that they don't feel welcome and don't feel that they're a part of, of your congregation or your group as well. So mm -hmm. it, those, those deeds of mercy and kindness go a long ways with, with, with both parties, with both groups of people. That goes good into our next scripture, Matthew 25, 34 through 40. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For why I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was, prison, I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we you hungered and fed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Every tiny, good, kind, merciful deed that you can do, it, it is a part of the work of God. And forbearing, and maybe not being judgmental if somebody is being brought in, all these things are a part of it. And that's not overly complicated, but that is a gift, and that's something that each and every one of us have to offer to the work. And knowing when that's appropriate and how to contribute it, that's our responsibility collectively and individually because a lot of what we've talking, been talking about, you know, it falls out on the individual level. It's, it's one person at one point in time that can make a difference, be it for good or for bad, in the smallest thing even. Next scripture I'd like to read is uh, Matthew 6, 7. This is kind of about how, how do you go about this. Matthew, se oh, pardon me, Matthew 7, 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. This is about what it's appropriate to give to each person. Do they need a little forbearance and forgiveness? Do they need a strong correction for whatever it is that you perceive? Uh, are they ready? Are they willing? Are they even able to receive the truth that you have? Because you can, you can throw some great truth in front of some people who are angry and dead set against God and have are not asking for it and not looking for it and you throw this beautiful truth out there and they'll trample all over it and then they'll turn around and they'll attack you for it too you know and so have you really done any good in that instance no you haven't Christ is saying you know don't don't do that it's not doing any good you're not helping that individual you're not helping yourself you're just getting a wound unto yourself right <laughs> and that that scripture that we just read comes right after the the parable of the the beam and the moat you know and it says cast First cast out the moat that's in your own eye, and then you can see clearly to help with other larger problems. But that's, that comes with self-awareness, self-examination, and, and then also being prepared, being prepared to give that kind of answer. Well, I agree with you. And it, it, you know, that scripture is really talking about the, the person who doesn't consider the, the gospel message of any value. I mean, it means nothing to them. And you're taking your most priceless possession and, and giving it to them or offering it to them, and they have no, they don't consider it of any value at all. And that's what Jesus was saying. They just cast it off and like to turn around and insult you. And uh, that, that's well put, Michael. I'd like to bring up the example of Paul on Mars Hill. I'm not gonna, not gonna read that because we're getting close to the end here. But you know, here's, here's Paul arguably the most effective preacher in, in the New Testament, the churches that he created, the people that he brought in. I mean, the examples of him him spreading the truth among Gentiles, not those that already, you know, had the truth of God, not Jews or proselytes or anybody that had the foundation to appreciate, you know, what Christ added to that, what Christ, or who Christ was really in that context, but Gentiles, and then and bringing them in and getting them interested in the truth of God and all of the truth of God, you know, bringing them into the synagogues to learn and to study and to, to do more. Paul on Mars Hill, you know, he's in the midst of pagan idols, just, just rank, you know, we don't, encounter a lot of that thankfully in our in our day-to-day -day lives and the way that he conducted himself and the way that he tailored his message to reach those people he didn't dismiss them and call them a bunch of fools or start <laughs> knocking things over and destroying them or anything like that he found one little bit of of truth in there an inscription you know to the unknown god and he's like aha <laughs> let me tell you about this you know he could have told them easily what was wrong with every other thing that they were doing but he said let me tell you what's right about this and let me tell you more about that and in in doing so he brought a lot of people to the truth by being able to discern uh, maybe restraining you know the the 
not just throwing everything in front of him at one time, but finding the one thing where he could get their interest and in doing so draw them into the truth. One of the World War II colonels or generals said you can't push, push a string across the table. You have to pull a string across the table in order for it to follow you. So Paul used this very small door of opportunity to allow himself to present his material in, to the minds of people. And, and like Michael said, he wasn't there to bash all of their other idols, but he was there to bring them gently along with his leadership and his style. And I, you, you can appreciate what he did. And, and the an enormous task that he had before him of trying to overcome all the idols of the of the obstacle of all the idols that this nation had and yet he found a way to do it and he did it with God's spirit and that was admirable on his part I'd like to continue with 2 Timothy 4 2 preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine that's really about being ready whenever with whatever is needed for the situation uh, and remembering the power of your example. Uh, the, the unrighteous can perceive hypocrisy uh, better than you can and uh, just, just having the knowledge there, having the example in place, having praying for wisdom and discernment, you know, whatever our gifts are, we can ask God to add to them and to help us with our weaknesses as well so that we all have a more uh, balanced thing. We're all going to have our strengths and our weaknesses, the ones that come natural to us, but being ready all the time and studying, it is, it is something, it is some effort that's required on our part uh, to be able to do the work, to be, to be ambassadors for Christ and his kingdom, if you will. Our strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 2 through 21, or all the way through 31, if you will. It talks about all the different members of the body, you know, the hand and the foot and the head. And, you know, do you, because, you're, because you might think, because we as human beings tend to classify some skills as being better than others, or even considering certain things talents and not other things. You know, everybody needs a foot. You need two feet. God willing, you got both so that you can walk and, and go around, you know, and as humble, as humble as whatever you think you have to offer may be, it is necessary. It's part of what we all have to do together. Uh, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You know, we don't need to sell ourselves short. Be confident, be thankful for the gifts that we do have uh, because, because Christ has already prevailed. He's, he's paid for our sins. Those are covered. And we're moving forward, and we will be successful now, in the future. Uh, there is no doubt about that. You know, the, when, when Moses sent the spies into Canaan, the 12 spies into Canaan, one from each of the tribes of Israel, uh, 10 of them were just terrified by what they saw. They said the people are huge and they're strong and they got fortified cities and all this stuff. And it didn't matter what they had just been through, that they had, that they had come out of Egypt, that Egypt was practically left in ruins. They were, still, they were still too afraid. They didn't have any trust in God to, do, to fulfill the rest of his promise to them other than Caleb and Joshua who said, no, like it, sure, it's true. You know, they're huge. They're fortified. It's going to be a big job, but God is on our side, and with his power, we can accomplish this task. This task will be accomplished, and it has been in our lives. And just take that faith forward with you. Apply that to any one of these openings that you have with whoever or whenever it may be. Try to know what's required with it and try to follow through on that promise. Sometimes we have jobs at work. They're huge jobs. <clears throat> and we don't know how we're going to get from point A to point B. But sometimes we start at point A and we work as far as we can. Then we go to point B and we work backwards to point A. And the solution comes in the course of time of how to connect the two dots, in other words, making simplifying it. But you may not know the whole answers, but if you just start to work and you build as far as you can and maybe you start at the other end and you come backwards, somehow the bridge is, opens up, the, the way the path is op opens up to you. So I, I believe you can do that. And, and that's sort of stepping out on faith, you know, in, in this example here, you have to sort of, you may not know how the road, where the road's going to go, and you can't 
draw it out and complete the course and say, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen. You just have to start and build and go forward and, and depend on the faith that you have in God that he will open the way up you as, as needed. Many, many jobs, many, many chores or things that break in my life and that I, I'm going to, I determined to fix myself. The, the, and the, I'm talking about practical things here. I'm not talking about spiritual things, but often the hardest part is getting started. If you have a new job, something you've never done before, something that you're going to attempt, oh, it's intimidating. And personally, I'm a bit of a procrastinator. And uh, like, I, I'm like, oh, no, I'm not ready. Like, I got to be ready. Like, I got to watch a video. I got to get all my stuff, whatever. Forget that. Like, that's a, that's a problem that I have. And the hardest part is just saying, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm starting right now. And once you start, God will bring us through to the finish line. It's not being afraid to get started in the first place. Last scripture I'd like to read today is John 17, 20 through 23. Neither pray I, and these are the words of Christ, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be a, that they be, that they may be, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and has loved them as you have loved me. Christ prays for all of those who have believed, that believed on him, that have believed on him through the words of those disciples, and we're among their number as well. These, these are the words that convince and, and convict us of our own shortcomings, that bring us to repentance, and God is going to bring us the rest of the way. We just have to be fully committed and part of that work until the kingdom of God gets here and on into it, because there's still a great deal of work to be done, fixing all the problems in the world after that point in time. We all have gifts and we all have talents that we can contribute to this, uh, be they ever so humble. You know, we can all show kindness. We can all pray for other people's problems. You know, those that we know of that we know need help or healing or whatever it may be. We can ex exhort and encourage. We can just appreciate, pat somebody else on the back, say you're doing a good job. You know, thank you for what you do. Appreciating other people is, that, go that goes a long way. That does a lot because often, uh, you know, maybe somebody doesn't get a whole lot of that in their life. They don't get a whole lot of pats on the back and attaboys and good jobs and things like that. And, you know, dole those out when they're when they're appropriate. You know, we can correct. Correction is necessary at some time, and that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, can be to say, you know, well, this is wrong, or you know, this is you're actually not in the right here. That can be a, a, a difficult thing to do. We can inform others. Obviously, we all know a great deal of the truth, and we can know more. We can stay in our Bibles and study, and those. You know, you'll, you'll find the things that you read, whatever they may be, even if you can only give it a few minutes per day, the things that you'll read and that you'll discover in there will apply. They apply to life, and that's what makes this book so timeless is, is because it's about uh, people, and it's about the truth, and it is about, uh, you know, how we conduct our lives, and that's what makes this epic, applying to all points in time. That's why it resonated, you know, from, from well, obviously it didn't resonate much in the time of Noah, but the truth, the truth was, in fact, the same, and it could have, you know, it could have, it, it can and it has changed the world and it will change the world dramatically uh, again. We stay close to God. We stay in the Bible. Uh, stay aware of the world around you. You know, even if you're just talking about things in your city or in your nation, and you have a bit of truth or like you can you can lay things straight. You can lay the truth in practical matters open to people. That's that's credit. That's a that's a gift that's needed. Uh, I'd like to give the example of my of my. Uh, great-grandmother <coughs> who was very sick at one point in time and it was a neighbor it was just a neighbor of hers uh, that asked her if she believed in healing and people came in and they, they prayed for her and she got better and that's what set my family on the path to finding the truth you know obviously that was a, a remarkable instance in their lives but then to to complete it you know, then obviously she's interested in what this lady believes, and to convince her, you know, she, she asked her neighbor about the Sabbath day, and the lady didn't have to give her any long sermon or anything like that of her own, but she knew where the scriptures were in her Bible about the Sabbath day, and let her read them on their own and turn to them one at a time. And when you think of the, you know, I, I wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for that instance. If it weren't for a single neighbor that had faith, 
to pray and had had the knowledge of where scriptures in the Bible were about the Sabbath so that God could convince her that the Sabbath day is true and the path that that led her down, that led her husband down and the, the work that he did and things that have transpired since then, you know, that started with one concerned neighbor. So if you don't think of yourself all that highly, I mean, consider the impact, you know, consider the impact on anybody's life who, who achieves salvation. I mean, that's something that stands for all time. And that's what we're looking to do is to help in God's work to build upon the foundation in a way that is going to stand for all time. And if either of you wants to add anything, otherwise I think we could conclude. That's a good place to conclude. All right, yeah. we'll, we'll leave it there. Let's close with prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we come before you. Thank you for this time that we have together, this work that we have to do, and the opportunity to gather and to study. Please strengthen us in our lives. Help us to live according to your word, to be good examples, to know what's right and when to do it and how to do it. Please increase all of our gifts, both spiritual and physical. We pray for your protection and the tasks that are ahead. We pray for your inspiration and for your guidance in all things. Help us to remain humble and close to you. And we pray, Father in heaven, fervently to increase your spirit in us and this organization and the work that we do individually and collectively. And we pray for your kingdom, Father in heaven. And we ask these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.